Welcome to ECE 376 Embedded Systems, Lecture Number 20, Timer 0 Interrupts. Now in our last two lectures we talked about Timer 2 Interrupts. Timer Interrupts are really useful. They let you keep track of time. They let you generate unique frequencies. They essentially let the processor do two things at once, the main routine and then the interrupt. Uh, because they're so useful, people wanted more. So Microchip now has four interrupts inside the PIC 18F4620. Timer 0 through Timer 3. They're all pretty similar. They all trigger after n events. With Timer 2, the one we just talked about, n is equal to a times b times c, where a, b, and c are stored in two registers, t2 con and pr2. Timer 0, 1, and 3 are slightly different. They expanded them so I can have an external input and count how many times to push a button, how many people walk through a door, or I can have it run off the clock, your pick. I can set the conditions for the interrupt. There's a prescaler. The prescaler can be 1 through 256 for timer 0, or 1 through 8 for timer 1 and 3. And like timer 2, you have to turn it on, turn it on, really turn it on, honestly turn it on, then globally turn it on. And there's the flag. What triggers the interrupt is when the flag is set, that triggers the interrupt. There's a bunch of different ones, which is why in our previous code we had if timer 2 if. This says, if I'm at address 8 in the interrupt service routine, somebody triggered the interrupt. To find out who it was, I check the flag. So timer 0, 1, and 3 are very similar. Just to have something more concrete to talk about, let's just talk about timer 0 interrupts. Now with timer 0, you have your choice. I can look at the external input, rising edges on port 8 pin 4. Or I can look at the 10 MHz clock, your pick. That's controlled by timer 0 source select. There's a prescaler. This is a divider. If you have a prescaler 1, then I will count every clock or count every rising edge. If the prescaler is 256, I'll count every 256th edge. Plus there's a 16-bit counter. That's timer 0. This 16-bit counter can count from 0 to FFFF, or 65,535. What triggers the interrupt is when I go from FFFF plus 1 to 0. That rep ran to 0 is what triggers the interrupt. So, let's go through a couple examples of interrupts. If I have timer 0 and I'm counting, let's say, edges, external edges, what's going to happen is that timer 0 is going to count. It's going to go FFFD, FFFE, FFFF, or using 2's complement, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. When I get to zero, that triggers the interrupt. Then I keep on counting. Eventually, 65,000 counts later, I'll get uh, minus three, minus two, minus one. Next time I get to zero, that triggers the next timer to interrupt. What that means is that the maximum time between interrupts, if I max everything out, is a 16-bit counter to the 16th times your prescaler, 256, gives uh, n equal one to two to the 24th which means I can interrupt anywhere between every 100 nanoseconds to 1.67 seconds if I max it out. And the 100 nanoseconds is a little bit deceptive. Like timer 2, I can't interrupt every clock. It takes about 50 clocks to trigger an interrupt, so it's more like 50 to 2 to the 24th time between interrupts. So to illustrate different uses of timer 0, let's start with an external event. Suppose they make T0 source select equal to 1. That means I'm reading edges on port 8 pin 4. When timer 0 wraps around gets to 0, that triggers the interrupt. If I initialize timer 0 to minus 7, then after 7 rising edges, I'll get to 0. That triggers the interrupt. So what I'll do is I'll have the interrupt service routine. When it gets to 0, that triggers the interrupt. This is a little bit different than timer 2. Once I interrupt, I have to set up the condition for the next interrupt. Next interrupt will be seven clocks in the future, seven edges. I'll increment n0, that's a global variable. Acknowledge the interrupt, then exit. To initialize the interrupt, I have to set the prescaler. Here the prescaler is one. I'll set the source to external, port 8 pin 4, and then turn on, turn on, turn on, really turn on, honestly turn on. Do that, and you now have timer zero interrupts are running, counting external events. And in the main routine, if I just display, this is minus timer 0, because I'm going to be counting minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. 
and display end. This is what it looks like. So here as I hit, well, actually, I've got port A pin 4 hot wired to port B pin 7. Then when it hit the button, RB7, that also lights port A pin 4. If you notice, timer 0 goes from minus 6, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. When you get to 0, that triggers the interrupt. When I interrupt, that reset timer 0 to minus 7, increment at n, and then every 7 clocks, I interrupt and n increases. So this is where timer 0 is a little bit different than timer 2. Timer 2, once I set up the number of clocks between interrupts, say 1 millisecond, it's always 1 millisecond. Timer 0 is different. If I take out this line of code, they're just commented it out, what happens is this. When I increment, it starts counting. but the problem I run into is I'm not going to get to zero for 65,000 counts. That's the default. Once I get to zero, I won't get to zero again until 65,536 counts later. That's why it's important with the timer interrupts. As soon as I interrupt, I need to set the condition for the next interrupt. So if I change that back, when I interrupt, I'll set up the next interrupt in seven edges. download the new improved code. And once it's done downloading, I now have initialized timer 0 to minus 7. I'm displaying minus timer 0. Here's minus 6. As soon as I interrupt, I go back to minus 7. Otherwise, I have to hit the button 65,000 times. So that's external events. One option with timer zero. There's other things you can do. I can have this run off the clock. And in that case, I can measure time or generate precise frequencies. If I change timer zero source select to zero, I'm now using clocks. And I can trigger after every one, really actually meaning 50, to two to the 24th clocks or 1.6 seconds. Suppose I make the, pre the prescaler equal to 1. If I don't change timer 0 in the interrupt, I'm going to interrupt once every 65,000 clocks, which is 6.5 milliseconds. So if I do that, here's what I get. And if you look on the oscilloscope, what I see is this is 6.560, 65,536 clocks between edges. That's the default. If I want to have something different, say if I want to have um, interrupt every millisecond, what I have to do is when I interrupt, change the condition for the next interrupt. I just interrupted. That means timer 0 is equal to 0. I want the next interrupt to be 1 millisecond later, which is 10,000 clocks. Uh, toggle just so I can see what's happening. Acknowledge the interrupt and exit. Now what happens is I'm toggling every 10,000 clocks. And as we see here, one millisecond. Uh, if you notice, it's not exactly one millisecond. It's 1.004 milliseconds. That 0 0.004 is actually real. What that means is it's 10,000 clocks between interrupts, plus the time it took to halt the main routine, jump to address 8, get to this line of code. That's about 50 clocks, just like with, with, with timer 2. So this is actually a little bit off. It's about 10,050 clocks between interrupts. There are ways to get it exact. That's timer 1 capture, timer 1 compare. We'll talk about that later. But for now, with timer 0 interrupts, I'm always off a little bit. Not by much, but a little bit, about 50 clocks. I can actually see how much I'm off. If I change this to something smaller, I'm seeing 50 clocks out of 10,000 is not easy. Try to see 50 clocks out of 100. Now it's more significant. On paper, I'm interrupting every 100 clocks. In practice, I'm interrupting every 150 clocks. Those extra 50 clocks come from the interrupt service routine. It takes about 50 clocks to trigger the interrupt. Hence, my timing's off by 50. 
What that means is if I know how much I'm off, I can compensate by making the number that I put up here 50 smaller. So doing that, let's generate a precise note. Suppose I want to play the note 587.33 hertz. To figure out the number of clocks between interrupts, it's 10 million divided by 2 times frequency. I want to interrupt every 85 13.1017 clocks. The fractions I can't do anything with, but the integer I can. So let's interrupt every 85 13 clocks. Uh, so I'll just make n equal to 85 13 minus 50. That 50 is kind of a guess how many clocks it takes to trigger the interrupt. If I do that, then every n clocks I'll be interrupting. And the note that I see on port C pin 0 is 588.2 hertz. So this is the program T0 frequency. I'm going to initialize n to 5813 minus 50 to account for the time it takes to trigger the interrupt. All I do is, when I interrupt, set up the next interrupt, toggle RC0, acknowledge the interrupt, and exit. Notice the interrupt is very short. That's typical of interrupts, get in, get out. The main routine, all it does is set up prescaler to 1, make the input, the oscillator, turn on, turn on, turn on, turn on, really turn on, honestly turn on, and then just display n, for lack of anything better to do in the main routine. And that's what I see. So what this looks like, looks at making n 85, 13 minus 50. It's 588.2 hertz. What it's supposed to be is 587.33. So it's off just by a little bit. And also notice this is way, way, way easier than what it was with timer 2. I don't have to do A times B times C, all, all that Mickey Mouse stuff, to say how many clocks between interrupts. If I want to split hairs, maybe bias by 50. And you got it. Okay, so with timer 1, or timer 0, I can output a frequency. I can also measure time 200 nanoseconds. The way you do that is set up a 32-bit counter. The reason for that is timer 0 is a 16-bit counter. Every 6.5 milliseconds this wraps around. So if I have an event that takes less than 6.5 milliseconds, I can just use timer 0. If it takes more than 6.5 milliseconds, I need to keep track of how many times it wraps around. So I'll have a 32-bit counter. The high 16 bits is how many times timer 0 wraps around. The low 16 bits are timer 0. Think of it like a clock. This is the second hand. This is the minute hand. Every time the second hand goes around, the minute hand goes up by 1. So if I have a race that takes 4 minutes 35 seconds, I can see the low part, 35 seconds here, plus 4 wraparounds, gives you 4 minutes 35 seconds. Same thing with timer 2, or timer 0. I'll have the low 16 bits right here in timer 0. Every time I wrap around, I'll update the high 16 bits. Together gives you a 32-bit time. So to illustrate that, uh, let's create a long integer called time. And inside the interrupt surface routine, every time I have a timer 0 interrupt, I'll increment time by 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. The reason for that is this is a 32-bit counter. The low 16 bits are timer 0. The high 16 bits get incremented by 1. That's what this does. And I'll toggle RC0 for no reason other than to see what's happening. Then in the main routine, I will display the current time. That's the high 16 bits. Add to it the low 16 bits, that's timer 0. Display it as 10 decimal points, or 10 digits, 7 decimal points. And this is what it looks like. Uh, it's been 124 point something, 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 something. And let's freeze it. I hit reset, that stops the processor. I hit reset at 131.0275679 seconds after reset. If I want to start over again, let's see. I'll turn off the reset. What that does is now when I hit reset, it's not going to clear out the old code. I'll just start from zero. So there, this is the time in one, two, three. Notice the time is actually in seconds. Carry it out to an insane number of decimal places. 
that's a feature of computers. Computers can measure time really, really, really accurately. Um, to give an idea how small 100 nanoseconds is, light, which travels at the speed of light, of course, light travels 100 feet in 100 nanoseconds. You can almost see the speed of light. Usain Bolt, the world's fastest human, can run 1.04 microns in 100 nanoseconds. That's less than the width of a human hair. The human reflex time is about a quarter second. So if I see a light turn on, then hit a button, that's 2.5 million clocks, 2.5 million times 100 nanoseconds. If you, you look at Einstein's theory of relativity, as I travel faster and faster, time slows down. If I were a pilot and fly to London and back, time will slow down by 15 nanoseconds just due to relativity. Um, if I have a pilot who flies back and forth their entire life, um, they will be, they'll live approximately 15 milliseconds longer than their identical twin because of relativity and time slowing down. Uh, it may not seem like a whole lot, but that is significant. When you get to things like a 4 gigahertz Pentium chip, 15 nanoseconds is 60 clocks. If I had two computers completely synchronized, one flew to London, one came back, the one that went to London would now be off by 60 clocks due to relativity. You can almost see that with the PIC processor. So 100 nanoseconds is really, 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 really small. Computers can measure time to an insane degree of accuracy. So with that, let's have some fun. Uh, let's see how long different routines take. For example, before we had this wait millisecond routine. Wait millisecond is supposed to take a thousand clocks or a thousand milliseconds, one second. Well, let's check that. I'm going to save the time before I call this routine, save the high 16 bits and the low 16 bits, call wait, now save the time, display the difference in time, and that will tell me how long the wait routine took. So if I do that, that took 0 0.992 seconds. This wait routine is a little bit too fast. I need to length a little bit. So there's a counter. I just count to 16, 617 for no other reason to slow it down. That 617 is just a hair low. Um, other things I can do. Instead of seeing how long this routine wait takes, that wait millisecond routine, let's do a floating point multiply. How long does it take a pick to do a floating point multiply? Well, if I just do like x equals 1.23456, uh, y is x times 3.462875, put that in the middle. Um, that takes 1,183 clocks to do a floating point multiply, or 118 microseconds. Okay, not a lot, but it does add up. If I want to do cosine, cosine takes 23,000 clocks, or 2.3 milliseconds. Arctangent takes 2.4 milliseconds, or 24,278 clocks. The LCD routines that we're using. The LCD out routine takes 16 milliseconds. Likewise, previously the timing was wrong when I used the LCD out. Each time I call the LCD, that burns 16 milliseconds. With interrupts, I can account for that. Actually, I, I can make sure I don't care about that, and actually have the timing correct in spite of the LCD routine. I can check my reflex time by hitting a button. So let's see how long it takes to push the button. I modified the routine to sit there and wait until I hit RB0. As soon as I press it, record that time. I'll then wait until I release the button. As soon as I release it, record that time. Display the difference in time to seven decimal places. And here's what you see. So I'm going to take RB0, press it, 1001, release. I held it down for 1.453377397 seconds. Let's see if we can get to five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that was actually 4.1491088 seconds. Uh, some things you can do with this. You can sit there and see how good are you at measuring time uh, before, you know, when you wake up in the morning, after eating, after going to the bars, whatever. Here's a way you can actually collect data. Have somebody sit there and try to guess what 10 seconds is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Okay, 8.5219752 seconds, not real good. 
I can see how quick my reflux time is. There I held the button down for 30.0377944 seconds. Going again. Another thing you can do, this is actually a pretty common project in this class, I can have a reflex timer. When I hit the button, it's going to generate a random number between 0, or actually between 3 and 10 seconds. When that time elapses, I'll turn on the lights. When the lights comes on, I hit the button as soon as I can. I'll then measure the time difference between when the lights turn on and when I hit the button, measure to seven decimal places. That's the reflex timer. I can sit there and find out are my reflexes better or worse after having Mountain Dew, after having a drink, in the morning versus evening, and do I have better reflexes than my classmates? Um, you know, other things you can do. With timer zero, I have an insane number of decimal places for time. Again, that's a feature of computers. Typically, computers can measure time really, really, really accurately. Everything else is a little bit harder, but if I can turn something into a time, I can now measure, you know, whatever I want. For example, like a capacitor. To measure capacitance, I could have it charge up to 5 volts and watch it discharge. The time it takes to discharge down to, say, 2 volts, if I can measure that time, I can tell you the capacitance to lots of decimal places. Um, if I want to know temperature, what I could do is convert resistance to frequency, say with a 555 timer, then using timer, zero, measure the period to an insane number of decimal places. So a trick in processors, if I can convert it to time, I can measure it really, really accurately. That's what timer zero does for you. So timer zero interrupts are similar to timer two, except I can now measure external events as well as time. If I measure time, I can generate a precise frequency, or I can measure time, just like I did with timer two, only now, I can measure time to one clock. That's lecture number 20, Timer Zero Interrupts.